Welcome back, everybody. You won't believe who's here. It's Cam Batley, CCO of Aurora Cannabis, joining us for the, I don't know, 256th time? It's been a few times. It's been a few times. Cam, you just got back from Las Vegas. Did I? Yes. Las Vegas. Yes. Sin yes, City. Sin City. Yeah. Sin and we, City. Uh, didn't commit a lot of sins, though. It was uh, basically no? coffee and Red Bull the whole really? time. Really? Oh, it was a lot of business to, to be done. There were some interesting news items about, uh, you know, some Aurora items. That... Well, tell me what's on your mind. <laughs> well, I mean, uh, the... The interesting sort of story in the Financial Post was, uh, you know, an, a criticism, I would say, of uh, CEO Terry Booth's discourse during his panel presentation at the conference. So seriously, um, if people don't know by now that Terry is an Alberta entrepreneur, he's not a banker, he's not a lawyer, he's an Alberta entrepreneur, and, and he's a straight shooter, um, I don't think they should really be surprised. Right. So now, you know, the other thing to, to bear in mind is, uh, look, we were, we were in the, the kind of atmosphere that has froth and fun, it's a casual atmosphere at the MG Biz conference. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, this is where, you know, people come together with different perspectives and ideas and positions. Mm -hmm. That's what's supposed to happen. That's what makes the whole conference a success. And the other thing is, you know, Terry spoke very specifically about what, for example, Ontario has done right uh, in terms of uh, the, the new government, the, uh, the Ford government, uh, came in and very decisively said, you know, the previous vision for retail in Ontario was a government monopoly. We don't think that's the way to go. We're going to do something different. So they shifted gears and they did it fast and they did it decisively. And uh, I think you, you'll you find that Terry said some very positive things about that. He did. He yeah. did. And uh, we actually looked at the comments in the Financial Post and said, well, the bottom line here is this is a guy who's created so much wealth for so many people that if he wants and to... And fast. Cut, and fast. Too. And if he wants to cuss and swear, I'm good with that. <laughs> I'm good with I that. I think most people have heard these <laughs> words before. <laughs> that's right. And no, but, but that's, that is the point, too. Look, um, uh, this is, this is the, the guy with the vision yep. uh, who, in, in less than three years from the sale of our first gram of medical cannabis, has taken us from the 24th company to get licensed mm -hmm. to delivering last week, and I hope we can talk about this, yep. the, the highest revenue number with, uh, that that the industry has ever seen. So well, let's high, talk about yeah, that. Yeah, let's do that. Let's talk about our earnings. Okay, so you reported earnings of 30 million bucks. Yeah, well, well actually better than that, but okay. 30 million, um, with, but on a pro forma basis, if we had wrapped in uh, all three months of med relief, it actually would have been even better, but 35.8 million. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that is by far uh, the most powerful revenue quarter that any cannabis company has delivered thus far. And we're very proud of that. Sure. Um, the other item in your financials that intrigued me was the one-time win of $85 million from, what was that? Oh, from appreciation in our capital investments. Um, ah. So these are our marketable securities. Oh, so you didn't sell a block of stock. We didn't sell that much, no. Okay. Um, so what, what, uh, what we've done with our accounting is acknowledge the fact that we've made strategic investments mm -hmm. in certain companies, and those investments have appreciated. So our shareholders have done well, the company's done well, and our partners have done well. And uh, so that's what you're seeing reflected there. And, and the, the rest of it, across the board, I was very, very proud of uh, the way the company delivered, uh, particularly on a logistical level, because, you know, everybody had a lot of questions as to how licensed producers were, were going to be able to, you know, hit the ground running or not. Uh, upon the launch of consumer legalization, um, there were so many SKUs, and we we had 250 SKUs uh, that we had to ship to 13 or 12 different jurisdictions. I think we got 12 of 13 uh, jurisdictions in the country, covering 98 percent of the population. Right, you uh, were one third of the sales across Canada. Uh, it, no, we can't say that because we don't have those kind of metrics. What oh. we did report in our earnings was Ontario, because Ontario's website, the Ontario Cannabis Store website, uh, did provide some early insights, mm. uh, and uh, what we were able to measure is that we had about 30 percent of the sales in Ontario uh, upon the uh, launch of consumer legalization mm -hmm. and also did exceedingly well in British Columbia where we had uh, four, uh, the, the top four selling um, uh, brands and products in British Columbia and five of the top ten. Uh, so I think we impressed out of the gate. I think we did very, very well and I want to give a lot of credit to uh, our logistics uh, and, and operations team because that's a very complex operation. Uh, they had to carry it out in a very short period of time and they did it near flawlessly and mm -hmm. I'm very, very pleased. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So uh, let's talk a bit about what's happening at Aurora Sky. I mean, we, we visited you recently. We're yes. going to release a video very shortly on mm -hmm. that visit and it was very impressive. I'm curious cool as facility, to... facility, isn't it? Yeah. Has it started to actually pump out product now that's that's matured and dried and oh, yeah. shipping into the market? Yes, uh, it, it so has. Let me we, ask remember, you. we got our sales license on 
October 17th, right. uh, or we announced it. Then. Right. Uh, so we announced that on the day of consumer legalization. Right. So here's here's the conundrum I have, is that What's we've got all these companies that are producing at maximum capacity, and I visited most of these things yeah. with warehouses full of product ready to go, yet across the go? country, everybody's out. I know, I know. And and um, that puzzles Where'd us. Where'd the weed go? I know, that, that puzzles us too, because we kept hearing the same thing, that right. there were some companies that said that they were you know, stockpiling product for up to or even <laughs> year mm -hmm. and then it didn't seem to materialize mm -hmm. when it was needed up upon the launch now maybe companies are holding some back and they're going to be shipping it over uh, a different period of time um, I don't have insight into that but we were puzzled by that outcome as well because is it uh, conceivable that perhaps the shelf life of cannabis it's not something even though you vacuum pack it it's not going to be in a condition that you would qualify as premium dried flour one year after it's been harvested and packaged? Uh, I would put it this way. Um, I, I would not want us um, sending products to the retail markets that had been stockpiled for too long. Well, we've been smoking a lot of your product around here. Everybody's very... <laughs> well, thank we you very much for that. We can't keep it in stock either. <laughs> Particularly Ed is very so, fond of Aurora's so, product. So you've been satisfied customers? Uh, well, I've been relatively happy, yes. Okay. More happy than normal. Okay, well, yeah. <laughs> I, have, more I have no CBD immediate guy. response to that. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so then now what are the big... So everybody's looking at these earnings that have come out since the yeah. October, uh, since November. Especially first, our stellar earnings. Well, your stellar earnings, but... <laughs> Un they're underwhelming as a as a whole. I mean, if as you look at the valuations yeah. relative to the earnings at this point, and there are some easy answers here that we have to we have to bring to justifying life. valuations. Yeah, yeah, justifying valuations, especially in the terms of if you're trying to use a you know earnings multiple valuation yeah. technique, it doesn't work. No, we're 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 not a bank. Right. Uh, we, we're not a, a mature industry that's been around for uh, twenty or forty or fifty or hundred years. Right? Sure. So there, that that has catalyzed a revaluation of the whole sector to the downside by call it thirty percent since, you know, the onset of the weakness in the S and P and the broader but markets globally. I, I, I question that. Is it a revaluation or is it just one of the the pullbacks that we see? Look, we've we've been you and I we've been watching this sector since it it was born four years right. ago or five years ago. Right. Uh, and uh, one of the things that thus far has characterized the cannabis sector is a lot of volatility. Mm -hmm. So big run-ups and then pullbacks, run-ups and then pullbacks. And we've seen that as a constant pattern. Um, I do find that we have to reassure people who haven't been in it for that many cycles of right. ups and downs uh, that this seems to be the nature right now. And of course, we understand the reasons why. Uh, you and I have discussed many times that we will get to a point very soon, I would say within, you know, let's say 18 months at the outside, uh, where we're going to be valuing cannabis companies based on their fundamentals, right? Based on their revenues and their EBITDA. We can't do that yet. So people are, are projecting forward. And they're valuing uh, the leading companies like us and Canopy and a few others uh, based on uh, an estimate of uh, multiple on future earnings. Right? Mm -hmm. So that's, that's what's happening. And it's realistic. It's realistic because you can't use the, the traditional measures, the traditional metrics of fundamentals uh, in an industry that is uh, not just nascent but also growing incredibly fast. And one measure of that is take a look at what happened in our earnings in our year over year on a pro forma basis. Our earnings were up, or our revenues were up more than 300%. Some of that came from organic growth. Some of that came from the addition of Canamed. Some of that came from the addition of uh, Medrelief and Anandia and some of our other companies. But the bottom line is uh, these, are, these leading companies in this sector, Aurora included definitely, are growing incredibly fast. And we know where we're going. And so the projections are, are not pulled out of anybody's hindquarters. Um, <laughs> they're, 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 coming, they're coming from the, uh, the uh, metric that we're using right now of funded capacity. So if we know what the funded capacity is today and in 12 months' time and in 18 months' time, uh, you can then calculate a rough estimate as to what the top line revenues for the leading companies are going to be. And with Aurora and Canopy, uh, for example, uh, both companies have more than 500,000 uh, kilograms or 500 million grams of funded capacity, which suggests that by early 2020, that's going to be the annual run rate of production, of sales, and therefore, with a number in front of that, uh, whatever number you choose, uh, in front of 500 million, um, that'll give you an idea as to what the top line revenues will be. Hmm. So it's not perfect. It is a little rough. Uh, it is early days, but boy, this industry has been validated as real, legitimate, and long-term. Sure. 
What would you say to the idea that that much funded capacity might represent overcapacity and thus induce a price competition in the price of the cannabis itself, rendering the projected margins of companies like Aurora and Canopy a little bit less than accurate? You know, I always really love your compound questions. Uh, <laughs> but I'm going to stick with that. This I'm is how I convince people that I know what I'm talking I, about. And you do, you certainly do. Uh, so I'm going I'm to track that. So there's two answers uh, to your question. The first uh, is, is, is 500,000 kilograms uh, per year uh, overcapacity? And the answer to that is uh, an emphatic no. And here's the reason why. Um, I've said this before, but the central fact of the global cannabis sector is a massive excess of demand over supply for legal regulated cannabis. Legal regulated cannabis. There's no shortage of cannabis in the world, obviously, there never has been. But legal regulated cannabis is in short supply. In even more short supply is legal regulated cannabis that comes out of facilities that uh, meet the standard of European Union good manufacturing practices, EU GMP. Mm -hmm. And by the way, that bodes well for us because we have two of the six uh, facilities uh, that are uh, certified uh, uh, as EU GMP and our European distributor, uh, formerly Padanios, now Aurora Deutschland, is also EU GMP certified. So big picture, there's massive uh, demand and not even close to enough supply and there won't be for years and years and years, long time. The second thing is, I think, more specific to Canada. And you're saying, will we end up with a price competition situation where there's uh, a lot of supply in Canada and pressure uh, on margins? If that's the case, um, we've planned for that. That is a specific scenario that we've planned for um, uh, with Terry, with uh, our CFO, Glenn Ibbett. Uh, and the nice thing is, we're low-cost producers. We're already among the lowest cost producers in the industry. And with our Sky Class facilities coming online, starting with Aurora Sky, which is uh, up and running at uh, Edmonton International Airport, we're, we're going to be producing a lot of cannabis at under a dollar a gram. We think well under a dollar a gram. Now, if you've got the ability to produce for such low cost, and you're highly recognized for the quality of your products, and you're producing premium products that are obviously in demand, um, then you're not looking at, at any problems in the domestic market and you're certainly not looking at any challenges uh, in the international markets where demand is going to exceed supply for a long time to come. Mm. That's a well, long-winded answer. A compound answer to a compound yeah. question. I'm that's, sorry. I'm, I'm shocked. No, that's <laughs> great. Um, okay, so 500,000 kilograms per year. Mm -hmm. You're involved right now in 40 clinical trials. Uh, 40 that we've either completed or are currently underway, plus seven preclinical studies that we have underway. So our science program is very strong. I, I actually would venture to say it's the strongest in the world because we've added Aurora, strong in science, uh, to Canamed, strong in science, Medrelief, strong in science, and then Anandia Labs. And I don't know that there's a stronger a deep cannabis science company in the world. Remember, that was founded, uh, co-founded by uh, Dr. Jonathan Page, who is now... Uh, last week was appointed our chief science officer, right. uh, and he was he led the team that was the first to sequence the cannabis genome. So the level of science uh, underlying uh, our work uh, has has increased dramatically over the last 12 months. Uh, we have more than 40 PhDs and masters of science working in the company right mm -hmm. now. Uh, the level of research, you indicated the number of studies either completed or underway, is very significant. And it's happening not just in Canada, but in jurisdictions around the world. And we intend to expand on that further uh, in 2019. Um, and the level of new product development, which is also tied into the science. Uh, I should have mentioned Dr. Kelly Noreen, who's also a PhD, and she's our head of research. She works closely with, um, with Dr. Shane Morris, uh, one of our other PhDs. We have what I call a PhD row. Uh, right. and, uh, and he heads up our new product development. He's the one who, uh, together with his team, was responsible for launching the first uh, uh, vape uh, cartridge in the Canadian medical system. Mm -hmm. We call it Aurora Cloud. And this is That's a... That's appropriate. Th isn't it? <laughs> but it's, it's actually, I'm, I'm sorry to tell you, or maybe not, it's a CBD uh, cartridge. Oh, no, that's right up my alley. I know. So it's a very, very uh, elegant and, uh, and in-demand product, and it's a, uh, a vape cartridge that fits in one of the standard gauges uh, to the batteries that people can buy in many places. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's a 55% concentration of CBD, and as soon as we launched it, it just absolutely flew off the shelves. Okay. At this point, is Aurora finding itself in a position where it's able to supply more cannabis than it can produce, or is it the opposite, that you're building up an, a surplus of cannabis? 
globally. Are we able to supply more cannabis than we can produce? Um, we're ramping up. Uh, right. There's no question. So, so at this point, though, you're still finding that everything you produce is swept off the shelves by demand. Yeah. Well, and if you think about that, that's that's pretty much always going to be the case. We're not going to be putting cannabis on shelves to to get aged, as we talked about earlier, um, because we've got three market segments that we're selling into right now, and the demand is powerful in all of them. Uh, we've got nearly 70,000 registered patients uh, in the Canadian medical system, and we have to meet their, their needs. And we've also been making sure that we have a diversity of products on our menu at all times uh, so that their needs can be met. We've got the Canadian consumer system. We've got our partners, uh, the, the provinces and the retail systems, and we need to supply them and make sure that, that those systems work as well as possible. Uh, and I want to circle back and, and deal with some of the criticism that the provinces have taken because I think it's out of line and, and mm. to remind me about that. And then the third market segment that we're serving obviously is our growing number of international markets. We don't favor uh, the second two over the first. The first is our greatest responsibility, our registered patients. Um, that's that's a, a matter of trust and we have to we have to meet their needs first. Uh, second uh, and third, uh, the consumer market and the international medical markets, um, we're, we're trying to do a very, very uh, good and wise job of product allocation to make sure that nobody is let down. Hmm. Okay. Now we were going to come back and talk about the criticism of the provinces, and I think it, it is out of line because, uh, as I've been saying for several months, we've been I've, criticizing the provinces rather egregiously ourselves. Well, you know what? Well, just this province. This is the one where we have everybody's it. looking uh, for. Um, you, you know, in the media, they say they don't report the planes that land, right? Uh, meaning um, everybody's always you know looking for the anomaly, and that would be bad news. I don't think that there's any bad news here. I think that the provinces are doing a, a pretty darn good job uh, of putting together a hurry-up uh, concept with respect to their uh, respective uh, retail systems. Uh, it will take some time to adjust, and it's to be anticipated that there will be some bumps in the road uh, when you are launching a nationwide, very complex new system uh, with 13 different jurisdictions and a whole lot of SKUs. You bet. All right, Cam. Well, we could go on forever, but our time is up. And uh, <laughs> thank you once again for joining me. That was great. I just realized I did it.